have, and they are also and, and also co-authors, uh, Nikita Kotolevsky and Maxim Panov uh, from Skoltex. So Maxim joined uh, EAU recently, so he's now at CII in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. And Alain Durmus, who was an assistant professor at TNS and we, we joined uh, Polytechnique uh, this year. Okay, so what is, uh, what is the topic of this talk? So what is, uh, so what is the problem I will tackle? So probably the tackle is the following problem, which are called generative models. So basically what is a generative model? It's a very simple problem. It's uh, to specify that you start with a large amount of data, it can be photos, for example, or text or images, so that you have a large amount of data. And what you are trying to construct in general is a parametric model. So it's a, you are willing to fit a parametric model. So in general, as a complex one, of course, and, uh, and the, the idea is to be able to uh, feed the, this parametric model in order to be able to reproduce uh, observation. So it's, it's not only about uh, simply you are not only solving uh, 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 you, are, you are not only solving a kind of uh, uh, likelihood uh, problem. What you are doing typically is that you are you given a, a large number of observation, you are willing to sample. Uh, you are willing to sample uh, new data which more or less resemble in some sense to this uh, observation. So it has become a very important problem in, in machine learning. And of course, it, it, it fixes exactly what I was doing because it mixes two things, uh, which are more or less uh, the things I've learned during my scientific career, uh, which are, uh, say, optimization or statistics or inference of high dimensional models in, in, one, in one side and the other side being uh, uh, Monte Carlo method, which means a sampling method. So it's a, it's a generative model is a, for me kind of perfect fit because it reconciles two, two facets of my work. Okay, so that will be the outline of my talk. I, I think I will not cover everything because it would be a bit long, but uh, I will cover first a kind of a gentle introduction to generative model. And I will we'll first explain what I call the old style way of doing this, which is based on Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, then I will explain uh, a bit uh, the modern way of doing this, which is based on what is called rational inference, or sometimes it's called so Markov score climbing and things like that. And I, then I will also uh, mention some ideas uh, to improve beyond vanilla method to do uh, rational to encoders. Next, I will present uh, uh, new methods, and, and I need two, uh, two techniques. One will be a sequential Monte Carlo, so I will take some time to explain what is a sequential Monte Carlo method. And then I will have to explain also some results from uh, Langevin dynamics. And then I will combine everything, and if time permits, uh, I will uh, go to the uh, more experimental session. Okay, so what is uh, what is uh, gentle introduction first to generative models? So, okay, so what, what I will uh, develop is called an autoencoder. An autoencoder is uh, what? So autoencoder is, uh, okay, so we take, uh, okay, so two encoders use latent variables. So you have latent variables. Uh, so it's, uh, okay, so I take this. So I don't know what doesn't work. Okay, no, no. Ah, so something strange happened now. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I don't know why. No. Okay. No problem. So we try to do this. Okay. So I stop. I share. Sorry about that. I share screen. Okay. This box. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, okay. So I sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, puff, 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 puff. Okay, then back. So to encoders uh, use Latin variables. Okay, so these are Latin variables. And the dimension of these Latin variables. I, I, I think that. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, we don't see the, the slide. Uh, okay, you know, just skip the slide. Okay, it's okay like that? Uh, yes, now it's okay. It's okay, okay. So you, are, you have a Latin variable. Okay, these Latin variables are in dimension D. Okay. So it's when it shares, I don't know what happens. What is the problem with sharing? Okay, so that variable and dimension D, uh, which is typically much smaller than the dimension of the observation space. Okay, so you have a space of observation and you have 
a latent space, and the space of observation is uh, much smaller than the latent space. Okay. Uh, okay. So what, what you model? What you have to specify? You have to specify a prior distribution, which is called P theta Z, and this prior distribution is supposed to be easy to sample. Okay. And what you need to specify also is a, a conditional distribution of the observation, which lives in super large dimension, given uh, the state variable. Okay, so you have three ingredients, basically. First ingredients, you have observations, which are in very large dimension. Typically, it is the best example of these images. Then you have a latent variable, which is typically much smaller dimension. So latent variable, you typically learn what is called a representation, so which is, uh, and this latent variable has a prior distribution. This prior distribution is quite, it's, uh, it's normally quite simple, okay? Uh, and uh, and then you have on the top of that you have a likelihood model, so you have uh, the you have a, a, a conditional distribution of the observation given the latent variable. Okay, so basically to, to generate uh, to generate the observation, what you have to do, you have to sample, you have to sample from the latent variable, and then you have to draw conditionally to the latent variable, you have to draw uh, the new observation. So the the first. Um, so there are many, of course, uh, possibilities to design uh, a latent variable models. The, the first uh, uh, attempt to do that, which was considered to be successful and which was using deep nets, uh, deep neural networks, has been done by Kingma and Wedding, okay, in 2014. And what they do, so in this case, the latent variable is simply taken to be a Gaussian variable, okay. From this Gaussian variable, you have you have a network. This network predicts numbers, okay, which depends upon z, okay. These numbers are, in, are between zero and one, and they are interpreted as a, a probabilities, and the pixel is uh, uh, it's a Bernoulli random variable. So each pixel is a Bernoulli random variable. So it's a it's a black and white image. So it's so each pixel is equal to zero and one, and the model, the conditional model of the observation given the latent variable. Say that each pixel, in fact, has is a Bernoulli random variable, which success probability, which is equal to p of z. Okay, so you have uh, so given z, okay, you have a neural net, okay, which is which has a certain structure. This neural net outputs uh, uh, numbers, in fact, d numbers, where d is the number of pixels. These numbers are between zero and one. And uh, in order to draw an image, what you do typically is that you draw. Uh, Bernoulli, independent Bernoulli random variable, which have a success probability, which are equal to this PG of theta. Okay. Okay. So what? That's that's very simple. So the, then you have a kind of decoder neural net, so which depends upon the weights theta of uh, the neural connection. So in in this type of application, you because it's a quite simple application, the number of uh, of parameters is not huge, but it's already uh, Say of order of say ten thousand something like that. So it's not small. So it's not three parameters. It's a, so the latent space can be dimension say sixteen. Uh, it would be of three of three to five uh, layer neural net in general more or less fully connected, and so which means that you have uh, easily something like uh, of order of ten thousand or one hundred thousand parameters. So it's it's already a problem. Okay. In order to fit uh, this parameter, what you typically do is that you will typically uh, compute the likelihood uh, of the observation. Okay, so you have a number of observations. So in the in the NIST example, you have uh, of the order of 100,000 observations. This is typically uh, the order of magnitude of for this type of model. And what you will do typically is that you will uh, perform some uh, optimization method. And the method, which is uh, in general uh, Currently used is to use a kind of stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so basically, what you need to compute is you need to compute the, the gradient of uh, the likelihood of the observation. And because the likelihood of the observation is uh, 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 you, you, what you what you have specified is a joint likelihood of the data and the latent space. So likelihood of the observation is the marginal distribution of the observation. So you have to integrate over the distribution of the latent space. So, so computing this gradient is, is not completely trivial. In fact, it's not so difficult because there is uh, the technique which was being used very often to do this is to take advantage of what is known uh, to be the Fisher identity, 
which is a very elementary identity. Of course, there are some technical details that we not spend much time on it, but what do we do when you uh, compute the gradient of the uh, incomplete that of, of, of the observation likelihood, which is a marginal likelihood. So of course, you're, it's uh, the marginal likelihood is simply equal to the ma marginal distribution of the joint distribution of X and Z, and you have to marginalize with respect to Z, okay? So very easy calculation, and you obtain at the end of the day that the gradient of the uh, likelihood is equal to uh, the uh, integral. The, the, uh, you, you take an integral with respect to the conditional distribution of the latent variable given the observation, okay? And you have to compute simply the gradient of the joint distribution of the observation and the latent code, okay? So that's an observation which has been uh, done a uh, long time ago by, by Fisher in the, in, the, in, the 70, in the 30s, basically. And so basically when you see this formula, in fact, now you, you, it's, it's not very difficult to compute these gradients, of course, because you have, even if you have a lot of terminal parameters, you can use, uh, it's a deep net, so you, you have some kind of back propagation that can be used, implemented. But the difficulty here uh, stems from the fact that you have to integrate uh, these gradients with respect to the distribution of the posterior distribution of the latent code uh, given uh, the observation, which is typically uh, untractable. And the classical technique, I would say the old style uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, what you do to do this, uh, you, you construct in a, a Markov chain uh, whose invariant distribution is uh, precisely the posterior distribution of the latent variable given the observation. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, of course, you, 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 you don't know the normalizing constant. So what you know, in fact, is the joint distribution of Z and X. So you, of course, you don't know the normalizing constant of this distribution, but because you use a form of MCMC, you know that knowing the normalizing constant is not in general an issue. So what you will do is that you will, you will draw a, a metropolis asking kernel, okay? With this metropolis asking kernel, what you will do is that you will uh, propose a move according to some proposal kernel, Q theta, and then you will accept or reject this move with this uh, metropolis asking ratios, okay? And of course, you don't know, you, 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 know the normalizing, you know this likelihood up to a normalizing constant, but because you compute the ratio, of course, the normalizing constant is, uh, is not uh, important there. So you can replace the conditional distribution by the joint distribution of the latent code and the observation. Okay, and then you obtain uh, you obtain a, a way to compute a gradient, which is still used. Of course, there are some advantage of doing this. So, what are the, the pro for this? Is that it's a perfectly sound framework because it means that you can uh, sample. You can compute an unbiased estimator of the gradient of the uh, likelihood. Okay, so there is no approximation there. And there are, of course, problems uh, we place against you. So first, uh, mixing time is bad because uh, typically Z is in quite large dimension. So you know typically that uh, all these uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method are negatively, the mixing time of this Markov chain is negatively affected by uh, the dimension. Okay, even if uh, some result exists, uh, which shows that this dependence can be uh, uh, like a polynomial in the dimension, at least in some cases. But uh, of course, uh, if the dimension is large, uh, you cannot expect that your Markov chain will mix very, very, very fast. Uh, it's always very difficult to, to have a convergence assessment. So it's not clear how much uh, sample you should use in order to obtain, uh, to remove the, the bias. Uh, uh, of course, you have the problem linked with the multimodality or metastability. So they are doing a lot of work in MCMC to try to, to, to design methods which are uh, more or less uh, robust with respect to the multimodality problems, which means that uh, you will have multiple, op multiple minima or, uh, in, the, in the potential. Uh, and of course, there are another problem which is not uh, been seen here clearly is that in fact the variance of this estimator typically is very high. So in fact, it's, it's called the score method and it's, it's very high, the variance is very high. So which means that you should apply either uh, variance reduction methods or you should uh, consider uh, other methods. So there, there is a completely different uh, method for doing this, uh, to, which is to replace uh, the uh, intractable posterior, 
uh, which is a posterior distribution of the latent code given the observation uh, into a tractable problem. And for doing this, what you do is that you introduce what is called an encoder or a recognition model, okay, which is a distribution that you pre specify. This distribution depends on another parameter. So now you have two types of parameters. You have the parameter theta, which is a parameter of the decoder, and you have another set of parameters, which is called phi. And this phi is uh, simply a, a parameter which parameterizes a, a variational distribution. Okay. And, and what is a way to uh, optimize this parameter phi? You optimize this parameter phi in such a way that the posterior distribution of the latent code given the observation should be close to the uh, uh, to the uh, variational distribution. Okay, so you fit uh, the uh, variational uh, distribution in order uh, you, you fit the variational distribution. You, you fit the parameter phi in such a way that this distribution be closed uh, to the distribution of the posterior distribution of z given x. Okay, so for, for the inference model, typically you, you use also uh, a deep neural network. So you, you, you simply decompose uh, the space Z of uh, the latent code. You decompose it uh, with a causal graph. Uh, and, uh, and, and then you, uh, you have uh, you design the parents of this uh, latent codes, PAG, and, and you do uh, typically deep nets in order to uh, parameterize these uh, types of uh, distribution. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so what you do is that you, you can do variational inference and you do what is typical in variational inference is that you do some, something which is called amortized variational inference. And in amortized variational inference, what you do typically is that you, you do variational inference, but at the same time, you use the same parameter phi, okay? is used for all the X, because remember that you have, uh, you have this X here, Okay, so you use the same x for all the parameter phi, and typically, so one typical example is to assume, so in the case where uh, the uh, the prior distribution of the latent space is Gaussian, uh, one quite natural way to represent the variational distribution is to assume that the variational distribution is also Gaussian. Of course, you can move from this, and you can do something which are more complicated, and you simply assume you will parameterize basically uh, the, the mean, mu phi, and the variance of uh, this uh, variational distribution. Okay, so if I, I want to recap, so what I have many objects now. So I have, first I have data sets. This is the examples that I have. Okay, so in in the uh, this uh, way, so I start in the in generative way. So I start with uh, by specifying a prior distribution p theta. The, this is the latent space. Then I feed this uh, Z into a decoder, okay? So the decoder links the observation space to the latent space, okay? So it's a distribution which is parameterized by theta and conditional to the value of the latent distribution, it, it just generates a new set of observation. So this, the observation space can be rather complicated. This, this is a way where you start from the, uh, 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 you start from a point in latent space and you generate new data. And then this is the inference part. In the inference part, you start with a point in the data set, okay? With the point of data set, you, you, you given X, you generate a point in the latent space according to the encoder model, okay? So you go there. And, 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 and what you will do typically is that you will use this uh, scheme in order to be able to learn both the parameter from the decoder model and the parameter from the encoder model. So the way to do that is to use what is called the evidence over bound or elbow. So it's a, it's a quite an old idea, which is uh, very, very simple by the way. So what you do typically is you define the elbow and the elbow is what? Uh, it's more or less linked with Jensen in, in identity inequality. Uh, so it's a lower bound of, uh, sorry, there is a mistake there. So it's a lower bound of log of uh, P theta of X, okay? And the, what is a way to obtain this lower bound? So if you look at Jensen inequality, so you integrate, that's the definition of elbow. So you take the joint distribution of X and Z, which is specified by the model. You divide by the conditional distribution of phi give, of Z given X, okay? If you apply Jensen inequality, you can take the log outside uh, this integral, and if you take the log outside the integral, you would obtain log of p theta of x, which means that this quantity 
is a lower bound, is always a lower bound of log of two of x. Okay. Uh, so it's called evidence because uh, this quantity is called uh, often in statistical physics is called the, the in Bayesian statistics called the evidence of the model. Of course, it, uh, elbow is linked with uh, well-known quantity in statistics, and in particular, it's linked with kullback uh, labeler uh, forward divergence. Okay. You simply take p theta uh, x z, so you take p theta x z, and then what you do, uh, you simply write p theta x z, you, you write it as the p theta of x, okay, that you multiply by uh, p theta of z given x, okay, so which is uh, the prior, okay, times the uh, posterior distribution, uh, it, it's a likelihood, I would say, it's a likelihood of the observation, it's p theta of x. And then it's a posterior distribution of z given x. You see what I write here. And what, what you see here is that uh, you obtain log of p theta of x, okay? So which is uh, basically the likelihood that you are willing to optimize. And then you have another quantity which appears there, which is Kullback level divergence between q phi, okay? The variational distribution and p theta x, okay? Of course, so this quantity is positive. It's a divergence, so it's uh, always positive. So which means that the elbow, in theta phi is always less than the log of uh, likelihood of the observation, okay? And of course, what, what is suggests, of course, is that the tightest the bound, the, the tightest this approximation is, or the better the, the, the variational approximation is to the, to the posterior distribution of z given x, of course, the tighter the elbow, the better is the inference model. So of course, I, I write that with, uh, uh, Kullback label or divergence, but in fact, any form of F divergence, so it's clearly linked with uh, F divergence, so any form of F divergence will, will do the job. And now, and now we have the, what is a schematic computational flow of a variational autoencoder. So you have data points, you have an inference model there, you have a generative model there, okay? And then you have an objective, which depends upon two parameters, theta and phi. And, and because you have this, now you have, you have all the tools needed to uh, uh, fit uh, this type of model, and you can already obtain uh, quite nice results. So the way uh, we proceed typically is that we use uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, uh, so which means that uh, you take the data set. So, the, so basically the elbow is uh, obtained as the sum of the elbow for all the observations in the data set. Remember that in this type of, of application, the data set is super large. So it's uh, 100,000 millions. So it's, it's not like uh, 10 data. So, so typically you, you never compute really the gradient. You compute a stochastic version of the gradient in the sense that you always subsample. So you take at every iteration, you take a subsample of the observation, you evaluate the gradient with respect to theta and phi of the elbow for the subsample of observation, and then you update uh, theta and phi. So there are uh, quantity which are easy to compute, quantity which are more compute. So wh when you compute the gradient with respect to theta, this is very easy because you simply have to compute the gradient of the joint distribution of x and z. And then you have to integrate uh, with respect to uh, q phi of z given x. So given phi, of course, you simply sample from the uh, encoder model, so which is q phi x with the current value of the uh, parameter phi. So it gives a, a sample uh, from this distribution and you simply integrate, so it's very easy. So it's a bit more tricky uh, to, to sample from uh, the distribution uh, when you sample from, when you, you compute the gradient with respect to phi. And when you do this, typically you, you do what you, you call what you do the representation trick. So what you do is that in fact of using in, instead of you can always use uh, the score uh, function. So you can always write uh, for the same reason than before. You can simply take the gradient of, of uh, the log of q phi with respect to phi. Of course, you integrate with respect to q phi. So th that suggests a kind of Monte Carlo. But you know that this Monte Carlo method is very uh, is very uh, expensive. So what you do typically is that you reparameterize uh, you reparameterize the uh, the uh, latent the latent code. So in order to reparameterize the latent code, what you do is that you take a fixed distribution, say epsilon, okay. Then you 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 define a mapping which depends on phi and x of epsilon, which is typically a, a diffeomorphism between 
the space uh, uh, Z and the space epsilon. So, so it's, there are, there, it's a different morphism between this space. And, and what you do typically is that you represent this, you represent this distribution. So the conditional distribution of Z given X through this mapping. So you draw epsilon according to G and then you apply to this distribution, you apply this uh, different morphism, so, so which produce Z. And, and, and doing so, you can rewrite the elbow directly with respect to this uh, distribution. And then now when you compute the differential with respect to phi, you don't have to compute the differential with respect to G epsilon. So you compute the differential with respect to the mapping and you can prove that this, this works much, much better, okay? And, and uh, in fact, what you do when you do, uh, when you do uh, variational autoencoders, you, you don't really specify you don't really specify uh, uh, the uh, variational distribution. What you specify, in fact, you specify the default morphism itself. So you, you always specify the default morphism, okay? And there are now a lot of ways to parameterize uh, the default morphism of that sort. Uh, and, and with a lot of structure uh, which, are, which can be used uh, and which are such that uh, it's parameterized very complex uh, default morphism in the space where it's easy to compute the, the differential with respect to phi, and also it's also easy to compute the uh, quantity which appears when you compute Q phi, which is uh, the Jacob, the determinant of the Jacobian uh, of the transform. So there are many methods to do that. You can do either uh, 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 volume preserving, so methods which are such that uh, the Jacobian is uh, exactly equal to one, or uh, techniques for which evaluating the Jacobian, the determinant of the Jacobian of the transform is, is easy. Okay, so that gives you the, what is called mean field uh, VI. So when you do mean field VI, so typically use, uh, as I said, uh, mean field VI, you, you, you are willing to represent the variational distribution as a normal distribution with uh, mean mu phi of X, covariance, which is diagonal and which is sigma phi of square of X. So you, you use an encoder on our net, which produce uh, two numbers, which are mu of phi and log of sigma phi. And then you use a representation trick. So you represent Z as, uh, so epsilon in that case is a Gaussian distribution. You represent Z uh, as uh, the, the mean of the Gaussian plus uh, the diagonal value of sigma phi, which multiplies every component of the value epsilon. And of course, in that case, the Jacobian is equal to the the product of uh, the, the, the Jacobian is the diagonal uh, of sigma phi of X. And of course, uh, uh, Jacobian is the product of the uh, sigma phi of X. Okay, so that's perfectly fine. It works well in some cases. And there are many, many works which have been done, uh, say between the very invention of this type of method with deep nets. So as I said, it's a work by Kingma uh, 2014, and there have been a lot of work in this direction, 2015, 16, 17, where people have proposed, uh, 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 people have proposed the improvements of, of these basic uh, schemes. Okay, and so there are, um, uh, um, a lot of activities in normalizing flows, uh, so, uh, which are uh, the flow which, uh, will be, becomes a very great guy now. He's very well known, working in deep mind. So he, he has proposed uh, many ways to construct uh, complex diophomorphisms. Okay, so the diophomorphisms are referred to normalizing flow. So I will not explain why, because it's kind of it's a flow in the sense that it is uh, a composition of elementary transforms. And uh, thanks to the recent advance in MCMC method. Uh, flows uh, and other MCMC and SPI method come to enrich variational distributions. I will not comment that, but there are a lot of works by Caterini, Salim and Sofman, and many uh, uh, people since then. Okay, so, so you, can, you can even do something a little bit more uh, ambitious, which is called auxiliary variational inference. In auxiliary variational inference, what you do is that you, you add another latent variable, okay, which has a different status, so you, you still have your decoder, so that this additional uh, latent variable, okay, uh, does not enter in really into the distribution. It's more uh, a way to specify a more complex distribution for the uh, uh, variational family, okay.
okay, so you, what you do is that you, you add a, a kind of additional uh, latent variable u, and, and you say, okay, so now in, instead of having a q phi of z given x, I, I have, uh, I have a, a kind of joint distribution of u and z given x, which ca I can factorize like that, okay, so which is given by uh, the latent u given x multiplied by the uh, Bowser distribution z given u x. And uh, using this representation, the, the, uh, the variational distribution Q of phi of Z given X is exactly equal to the marginal distribution of Q phi of U Z X D U. Okay, so you marginalize, you marginalize with respect to uh, U. Okay, so it's, it gives you another, uh, another uh, model. You can extend also the generative model. So now you, you add this u variable. So if you add this u variable, so now you have a joint distribution between x and two latent codes, so z and u. So you can always write it like that. Okay, so you, are, you have uh, p theta of xz, which is a quantity of interest. And then you have p theta of u given xz, and you can find what is called an auxiliary variational inference elbow. So it's an elbow, which is now, which is extended because you have two latent codes. But it has basically the same structure as before. So it's x, z, u. So it's a joint distribution of the observation and the two latent variable divided by the joint distribution of the latent variable given x, and you integrate with respect to q phi z u x. So when you do that, uh, you can always write uh, it uh, easily. Uh, you can you can always write the the, the elbow of the ABI. It's it's uh, it's always uh, larger than the elbow of the VI by a quantity which is easy to compute, which is a kind of uh, integrated Kudback labeler divergence, which is written there. So of course, when you add new latent variable, of course, you, you, you deteriorate the elbow. So, it's, uh, so the elbow gets worse because you, 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 you have more latent variables. So you, uh, your elbow is, seems to be less tight, but of course, because you're, the class of inference distribution that you use, it's much uh, better. Of course, what happened is that the, the elbow that you obtain can be in fact better than the classical elbow in the sense that you have a much more expressive uh, distribution, uh, variational distribution, so which means that you can uh, uh, outweigh the additional cost of using uh, additional uh, latent codes uh, in order to uh, uh, get a, a better and, and more uh, accurate uh, 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 encoders, okay? So the, it's a kind of trick. So if you, of course, if you use uh, very simple encoders, there are, uh, so if you, if you use very simple encoders, the problem is that there are not much parameters typically, so that seems to be promising, but at the same time, you will be very far from the posterior distribution of Z given X. And then if you use very complex model, basically, of course, the problem becomes worse because you have to introduce more latent variables, but at the same time, you can have much more expressive model. So, so you have to more or less, uh, and, and okay, that, there is a trade-off that can be analyzed theoretically in order to adjust uh, this stuff. Okay, so now I will uh, explain a bit uh, what I do. So uh, what, what, I, what I do, in fact, is I use uh, AVI, uh, uh, with, uh, in comparison with sequential uh, Monte Carlo, okay? And uh, within this, I use uh, Langevin dynamics. So, so perhaps I will skip this because it will be a bit long and I will just uh, tell you uh, what I do at the end of the day. So, so you will have all the slides, of course. Okay, so I skip Langevin dynamics. Okay, okay, now we, we do that uh, quickly. Okay, so okay, so we go over. Uh, how much time I have? Ten minutes? Yes. Ten. Okay, so we let's go for ten minutes. Okay. Like so crash course from sequential Monte Carlo. Okay, crash course. Five minutes on sequential Monte Carlo. Five minutes for Langevin dynamics. So it will be very fast. Okay, so sequential Monte Carlo. What is sequential Monte Carlo? You, you know, everyone of course of you know what is important sampling. So important sampling is a way to, uh, to integrate a function f given a certain target pdf, p. And what you do typically is that you specify a proposal distribution, which is denoted by q. Uh, and you assume that uh, the support of q covers the support of p, so which means that you can define 
the importance weights, which are called W, W of Z, which are the uh, ratio of P of Z and Q of Z. And, and what is the key identity for important sampling is that you, when you integrate F of Z, you integrate with respect to the, distrib the proposal distribution Q, and you integrate the function F multiplied by the import uh, importance weights W. Okay, so this suggests, of course, the classical important sampling estimator. Uh, of course, when you, in many, many cases, you, the target distribution is, uh, is not normalized, so we, you cannot directly use the set normalized, and so you cannot really use this quantity because you know W simply up to, uh, 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 import, uh, to a normalizing constant because you know P of Z up to a normalizing constant. So what you do typically is that you use what is called a self-normalized important sampling estimator. So self-normalized important sampling estimator means that you uh, simply uh, renormalize. The, sorry, there is no this, there is no n minus one there. Sorry, there is no n minus one. Okay, so you simply renormalize the importance weight by the sum of the importance weights. Of course, the problem is that you have a, a bias estimator, so there are the bias can be computed. But the thing which is interesting is that nevertheless uh, the uh, the sum of importance weight when P is not normalized is still a normalized estimator of the normalizing constant P of C. Okay, this will play a role in the sequence. So what is sequential important sampling? Well, now, so now imagine that you have, instead of having one distribution, you have a sequence of distribution. So I denote the sequence of distribution PK. And this sequence of distribution PK is typically a sequence of distribution over an increasing set of state space. So what you are willing to, 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 sum, to integrate this time is not a function of a single z, but now you integrate function which depends upon an, a k coordinate. So at each k, you have a function which depends upon k coordinate and you have a distribution pk, which, uh, uh, which is the distribution over a, a product set uh, z uh, to the power k, okay? So what you, of course, what you could do is that you can, for each k, you can propose a proposal qk, and you can use a PDF, but there is a trick there. So in, in the sense that what you can do is that you can uh, use a QK, which has a Markov structure. So which means that in the forward sense, you have to define simply uh, a sequence of Markov kernels. So which is, I write that with transition density in order to avoid uh, problems, but you have a sequence of Markov kernels. So, so which means that the joint distribution QK can be written sequentially as follows where mk are simply a Markov cap. <clears throat> and what you do then when you compute wk, uh, of course, because you have uh, pk divided by qk, but now qk has a special structure. So typically you uh, might uh, use, uh, so you have a kind of recursive formula for wk. So it's not exactly recursive because uh, pk, it, it would be recursive provided that pk has, has a special structure. So if you simply do that, so you, can, you can run this uh, in a sequential manner. So what you do, you start with, uh, you propose according to Q1. So you start with the sample Z1, Zn according to Q1. Then you compute the first importance weight, W1, okay? Then at time K larger than two, what you do is that you given uh, Zk minus one, I, okay? You compute the next uh, candidate, Zki, I, okay? according to the Markov kernel MK, then you compute the new uh, unnormalized importance weights, which are called WK. Uh, uh, you use the formulas that I showed before, so which means that WK is simply equal to uh, the product of uh, WK minus one times the incremental weight, which is written there, okay? So I, I write that. And of course that gives you sequential important sampling, typically when you do particle filtering, but I will not do that here. What you do is that you add, in fact, a resampling step in order to avoid uh, degeneracy, which uh, occurs if you simply uh, perform sequential important sampling without uh, resampling. But uh, I will forget about that. So now, in order to obtain a, a simpler solution and to obtain what is called sequential Monte Carlo sampler, what you typically do is that you, you use a sequence of distribution, which has a very special structure, okay? So you start by specifying, you start by specifying uh, a family of distribution gamma k, which is specified on the set z. Okay, so you take you, you take gamma k, so it, it is specified on z, and 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 then you 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 add you define a, a sequence of distribution over z k, 
by introducing also Markov density, but in reverse direction. So instead of, so you have this gamma k, and what you do is that you, you, you multiply this gamma k by Markov kernel, but which proceed not in the uh, uh, forward direction, but in the backward direction. And the funny thing, of course, because of the spatial structure and because LK are Markov transition kernels, it's easy to see that if you look now at the marginal distribution of PK, the marginal distribution of PK is exactly equal to gamma K because you integrate all these Markov kernels integrate to one, okay? And now you have, you have now a spatial structure. So if you look at the expression of these weights, you, you have a, a spatial structure because you have a, a kind of sequential definition of this PK and PK minus one. So which means that you have a, a very simple way to generate uh, the weights and the weights are given in this, in this case by these very simple quantities which looks a bit like, it looks a little bit like the quantity which appears in MCNC. And in fact, there are relations between these, these two stuff, okay? Of course, you might ask what are the best, uh, what are the best kernels? So given uh, MK, so you are willing to sample gamma K, knowing uh, MK, what are the best kernel LK minus one? Because you see there that uh, this kernel LK minus one uh, uh, are more or less instrumental because you are interested in this, gamma k, you are not interested in lk minus one. So, and, and you can prove more or less that the, uh, so if you are interested, you can look at the paper by Del Moral uh, on sequential Monte Carlo, that the optimal kernel are given by this. Okay, and then you obtain, you obtain, you, 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 you might uh, obtain, uh, 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 it's a way to obtain uh, uh, an, an estimator of the normalizing constant of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the distribution. So what you do typically, so the first idea to obtain the normalizing constant for distribution. So if you want, so you want to compute, you want to compute the normalizing constant of P of Z. P of Z is, is not up to normalizing constant. You know that this is an unbiased estimator, but of course this unbiased estimator can be extremely bad uh, because the valence is, can be very large. The valence of the weight can be very large. So there is a way in order to obtain better estimator. So the way to obtain better estimator is to use what is called annealing important sampling. So when you define an important sampling, what you define, you define a sequence of distribution, okay, which more or less bridge, uh, uh, which, which forms a bridge between P and Q. So uh, between the target and the proposal. So you use an annealing schedule, so a sequence of beta K, which go from zero to one. So it's defined an annealing schedule for each beta K, it defined, you define a gamma K, okay. Defining a gamma K, you obtain, uh, you define this auxiliary vector LK minus one, and then, uh, what you do is that you uh, estimate what is called the anneal important sampling estimator of the normalizing constant. You use sequential Monte Carlo as shown before, and uh, you use it. And, and what you may prove is that you sample, uh, uh, you will sample at the end of the day with this estimator because PK as uh, the way you, you, you have constructed this sequence of distribution, uh, WK uh, is uh, the normalizing constant of the, the, the distribution lambda k, the normalizing constant of the distribution lambda k, uh, the distribution pk is exactly equal to the uh, normalizing constant of the distribution gamma k. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a nice it's a nice method, and it's, it, more or less it's a method which is used in statistical physics to compute free energy. It's a method which is used uh, in set in Bayesian statistics in order to 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 do uh, this stuff. Okay. So, so what, what we do typically is that uh, we skip the Langevin part. So the Langevin part is a way to construct this kernel with uh, discretization of the Langevin dynamics. And then we go to what is called a sequential uh, ARS, uh, sequential important sampling. So it's uh, exactly what I want by the last part of my talk. So what we do is uh, the following thing. So now what you are willing to do, they are willing to, to compute the, a normalized, so remember what I'm willing to do, and I'm willing to compute a, a normalized uh, distribution, uh, the joint distribution of X and Z, so which is observation and latent space, okay? So, so that's, that uh, I, I, I say, okay, I define a big K, so big K is more or less like uh, the parameter, so it, it is the number of leading step I will perform. Uh, what I do next, I do, uh, uh, I start uh, at a time gamma zero, I start with uh, a very simple distribution. So Q5 Z of X. So typically the distribution that I will use for a classical VA. And then I define bridges density. 
Okay, so I bridge the density between the target distribution and my variational uh, inference distribution. So I bridge this density. So it defines a sequence of annealed uh, distribution. And I will define the sequence of any distribution and I will put the sequence of any distribution uh, uh, in, within an MCMC, uh, within a, an annealed important sampling uh, step. So I define a sequence of Markov kernel, which are also indexed by X. And uh, we take all this Markov kernel to, to, to have gamma k of x invariant or approximately invariant. So I will practice it better to take to have them approximately invariant. I will explain why. I will not have time to explain why, but it's, it's much easier. And then I, I, I will also uh, define a backward kernel on the, in the reverse direction. Okay. And when I do this, uh, I have now a perfect method to, to, to do. Uh, 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 an independent sampling, okay, because I have specified the family of kernel forward in time and the family of kernel backward in time. And I can compute uh, an unbiased estimator of the normalizing constant, okay, P at theta of x, which is this time given by this uh, ratio, okay. And, and uh, doing this, in fact, uh, you obtain, so uh, uh, these, these, these weights are defined as a product of the weight, which are given by this, okay? So you have to carefully choose uh, LK minus one and NK, and this is why we use uh, uh, Langevin, uh, euler maruyama uh, discretization of the Langevin diffusion, okay? I skip some details there, and I obtain at the end of the day, I obtain a kind of uh, elbow, uh, based on this uh, an important sampling estimator, which can be, uh, I can use the reparameterization trick and uh, I can optimize everything. And at the end of the day, I have obtained uh, a kind of uh, auxiliary uh, VI method, uh, which, is, uh, which is amenable to uh, uh, this reparameterization trick. And then I can learn uh, phi and theta. So I will, I will show some examples now. So I skip this part, which is a bit long. Uh, it's interesting, but it's a bit long. And I do optimization. So it's a met flow, it's very long. So I will not show that. And uh, now some results. Okay, some results. Uh, this is typically the type of results we are, we are looking at. So it's, uh, it's here I, I take, a, it's more like a sampling result. So I, I sample, uh, a Langevin distribution, so it's uh, with an important sampling, and I compare the so it's different method to do that. And you see that we are reproducing uh, with our methods, uh, we are reproducing very uh, uh, so that that's the original distribution, and that the distribution we are about to reproduce. So it's, uh, it's a good way. And, and we have also performed, uh, we have also performed a uh, uh, kind of uh, a comp comparison of our method on a different data set, and we are more or less our method, which is uh, uh, on the, the top one, so it's a blue one, so it's LMCVIE, more or less uh, reaches uh, the best performance, is, is much better than VIE. So we, we have a kind of uh, two or three nuts, and uh, so which, which is a good result. Okay. And that's typically the type of images that we are able to produce. Uh, without MCVIE, so we have uh, uh, this type of image, of course, with, with this type of simple data. Okay, so uh, conclusion. So uh, many interesting things to, to do. So you can combine uh, uh, optimization and Monte Carlo. So a lot of ideas that have been used in Monte Carlo can be successfully applied in this uh, area. Uh, there are still a lot of things to understand. You can do uh, both. Uh, Methods are algorithms to design. You have many things to understand in terms of uh, uh, what are you learning when you're doing this. And uh, so it's a very exciting uh, piece of job. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, papers, uh, it's a paper which have been in New Rips last year uh, with Anouloucé and uh, Ashilton. And we are uh, preparing now a kind of uh, a survey paper on this, uh, what I call uh, differentiable uh, uh, stochastic uh, uh, mapping uh, for VIE. So thanks for your attention. I, am, I will take questions now. Thank you for this uh, perfect talk, uh, Eric. Are there uh, any questions, please? <clears throat> uh, 
Any questions? When you said the Q5, Z, given X is equal to the yep. polar distribution P theta, what do you mean by word close? Uh, typically, what you are close means that you are the, the thing is that you are, it should be closed in terms of uh, the Kullback Leibler. So, uh, so the, typically, what you have to measure the, the difference between uh, Kullback Leibler. So, okay. one, one way to measure to, so, so, so you are minimizing something which is like uh, the Kullback Leibler divergence, but you, you it can be also uh, Wasserstein. So, you have Wasserstein VIE. So, so you, at some point you need to have a kind of notion of measure, okay? So you, are, you, you have to measure the discrepancy between uh, P theta of Z given X and Q phi of <laughs> Z given X, okay? So what, what, you, what you need is that you have to fit, uh, so you have to minimize some kind of distance. So uh, when you are using elbow, uh, you use uh, uh, Kullback labeler, but sometimes it's advocated to use uh, Wasserstein. For example, you can use Wasserstein distance of uh, order two, or okay. uh, Sinkhorn distance, or something like that. But uh, so you have to take in mind that uh, uh, you have to be careful because the dimension is large, are large. So, so in fact, uh, both the dimension are large, and you have a large amount of observations. So you need to be okay. So, uh, so you have to take. Uh, uh, discrepancy measure which uh, scale nicely with the dimension, for example. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, and the, in the section of mean field piece, if you go to the section, beginning of the okay. section mean field. Yeah. You, okay. And you use the, okay. Uh, mean field is, uh, yeah, it's mean field. It comes from mean field from physics because the idea comes from physics, in fact. So they use a kind of mean field. Uh, so you do the mean field, the VI. Uh, so what you do there is that you assume that you, uh, so conditionally to, uh, so it's, it's a model, of course, it's not uh, the true distribution, but uh, uh, mean field, the mean field VI, so it is called mean field VI, is to assume that conditionally to X, uh, all the Z are independent conditional to X, okay? And typically, uh, you, when you do this, you, on the top of that, you say that the Z, for example, are uh, Gaussian with a certain mean and a certain variance. Okay, why Gaussian? Why normal distribution? Uh, because uh, here I, I have assumed that uh, the prior distribution is normal. Of course, you can use uh, hierarchical distribution. So uh, this is typically what you, uh, uh, this is typically the, the, that you can modify by using, uh, uh, you, you can modify it by using uh, flows or something like that. So, so that, that's typically the, the first uh, trial that people have done is that they have uh, tried to, to, to make a Poisson distribution which are more complex than Gaussian. So it's, uh, I have okay. to on this. Uh, so, uh, so typically, of course, that's, uh, uh, this, this was in fact the first uh, attempt which has been done. It works nicely on simple cases. If you are willing to attack uh, more complex models like uh, uh, natural images or something like that, and in order to have good quality images, then you need to, of course, to, to use a much uh, better uh, uh, approximation. Okay, okay. Uh, and, and what happens if uh, capital N goes to infinity becomes very large? Well, big, N, big N is always very large. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, that, uh, so it's, it's, yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, necessary uh, because you, you need to learn, uh, in fact, the complex model. So basically, the, the thing which are uh, very original with respect to classical, I would say, uh, statistics or uh, uh, problems that you typically tackle in stat. Uh, is that uh, the number of observations is huge. So typically, uh, so a very simple model like a NIST model is, let's say, 100,000, okay, that's very simple. So if you okay. look at, uh, if you look, for example, at a model like Celeb, uh, in Celeb, you have uh, one million of images, or something like that, so it's uh, like a million. And, and then, and, and typically, if you use, if you want to use a kind of, uh, a model which is competitive to produce uh, high quality image, typically you will have uh, uh, the number of parameters can be something like 100,000 or even more than that. So it's, 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 it's really huge in fact. In terms okay. of... mm -hmm. Other questions, please. Uh, 
Are there other questions? Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for your week. It is a nice talk. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Rafiq. Oui, attends un peu, Nabil. Oui, Nabil. Oui. Euh, Est-ce que tu pourrais récupérer les, euh, les transparents Oui, tout de suite. Ça, ça permettrait de mettre à jour le titre de la conférence. Il, il, il est parti au Je pense, oui. Oui, attends, tout de suite. Ok. Euh, attends, Nabil. Attends. Bon, ça va, quoi, c'est pas... Oui, le, la chérie, oui, la chérie, la prochaine, Sana. Merci, Sana. Oui, avec plaisir. Allez, très... Merci, merci d'avoir l'idée d'inviter Eric, hein. c'était très bien. Oui, Sana, ça fait très longtemps que, que m'a invité Eric. Et... Bon, malheureusement, aujourd'hui, je n'étais pas vraiment très satisfait de, de la présence. À Kaura, vu, vu le, le, c'est la fin de l'année, les gens commencent à... Et puis, cette, cette année, on a eu du mal à avoir plus que 20, 25. Hein, parce que... Oui, ouais, 19, 20, c'est pas mal. Hein. Oui, mais... Mais... l'année dernière, ça... Il n'y avait pas beaucoup de, de webinaires. Maintenant, tout le monde en a. Donc, Exactement. Normal. On se partage Exactement. la clientèle. Oui. <rire> ouais, ouais. mm -hmm. Non, non, mais c'est honnête, je trouve. Ma, ma, 